Hello, Metal Data family. Welcome again to another amazing episode of our Python tutorial series with the Metal Data team. And we know it's been a while and we are back with new items for you. Um, in this new phase, what we'll be doing is we'll try to reproduce some outputs from earlier studies that have been done. And that's by way of, you know, trying to make us understand the application of these scientific computing techniques or measures on atmospheric science and climate related data and so on. And I believe this will come in very useful for you. All right, so to set this rule in, we are going to be looking at the um, onset and cessation characterization by, which was done by Dunning et al in 2016. And if you're new here, don't forget to subscribe, join the family, let's grow together and let's learn together. All right, okay, so this is what we'll be trying to reproduce where we have the rainfall data itself shown in the red and then the anomaly, which is the rainfall data, okay, minus the climatological information, which is the mean or the average year. And then beyond that, what they tried to do in their study was to perform a cumulative of the anomaly and then use the dips and then the peaks to be able to identify the onset. And in this case, this is just, you know, a more unimodal pattern. And so it's quite easy to just use your high points and low points as representative um, in the representations. <clears throat> it gets it gets a bit um more of a work when you have multiple seasons and then have to, you know, identify or classify all these onset and cessation is based on the multiple seasons and all that. And we'll try to address that. Okay, so I believe by now we are quite familiar with this. So we import XR as XR, we import NumPy, which is for our numerical packages and numerical items that we'll be using as NP. We also import matplotlib.pyplot, which is a visualization component as PLT. And in order not to flood our page or the notebook with all the warnings from some, some um, packages I'll be getting obsolete soon and then some things that are not necessarily errors but just you know highlights or warnings we employ the filter warnings from the warnings package and then we use that to ignore all sort of warnings and so we can run this and we have our packages loaded up um, and then now currently where I'm working on we'll be making use of the Persian data so if I should list from my Persian directory you notice that we have Persian files for different years from 2001 all the way to 2022 and so we are going to read this data set with the xra but we also have other auxiliary information which we wouldn't want to make use of so we are making use of only the data that starts with per or let's say Persian and ends in the character or the 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 the, the strings nc okay so we make use of the open underscore MF data sets. XRE has open data sets for opening a single file, but this time we are opening multiple files. So xr.open underscore MF data sets. And then we indicate the directory slash the file. So the file in this case, we are saying it all starts with the word PER, or it starts with the letters PER, and then it ends in .nc. So all the other auxiliary files will be ignored. And then the file has the time components name, um, it's actually named as date time. And I just for simplicity sake would want to rename this to time. So I would make use of a dictionary approach and tell this to rename the file um, dimension of date time to time instead. And then missing data as um, captured in the, D, um, the, the Persian data was um, given as minus nine nine. So I use this approach, the where method, where I'm indicating first from here, I indicate that, okay, the data set we have is, I mean, named as data, but I wouldn't want to make use of the entire data set because a data set can be a combination of, you know, data arrays that's multiple variables. But then when I'm selecting just a single variable from it, then I'm just dealing with the data array. So now we pull our presentation from the whole data set, which is our data array of presentation, and indicate that wherever the presentation isn't minus 99, it should be captured as such. So wherever it is minus 99, that would go to a none, all right? And it's very easy then to assess 
or work with the data. Now, if you are going to perform some means and all that, we don't want the minus 99 coming in to affect the um, computation. So that's why we just use this to replace that or change those to nuns. And we are done. And so we have our data. And we can then clearly see what our data contains from here. And it's treated as chunks because of the open MF data set, right? And that's quite easy and simplistic for us to use. Okay, with that out of the way now, we need to create a day of year groupings because our x axis will be based on the day of year. So that means we are going to use a Julian day approach. And so with the data we had, which now has the time component, first, the data is over an entire domain of 2D with time, so now three dimensional. So we want to have the aerial average. And so we find the mean over the longitude and latitude for the data. And then we group the whole time aspect or the time dimension on the basis of day of year. So you're saying that pick the time component and group it on the time component of day of year. And so once we are done with this, this would only create the groupings. This only It doesn't perform any um, extra stuff. It only clusters our data into their respective group. And so when we check what the DOI data contains, it tells us it's created groupings of day one to day 366 which is the Julian day representation. Okay. Now, in order to create, uh, to find our normal, we could simply, you know, go by this approach, but then we decided to build a function instead and name that function stand, which is for more like anomaly, well, the concept was to perform a standardized anomaly, but currently we are not doing the standardized anomaly. We're just using anomalies instead. So we named it stand and then our X represents the data set and then the name for the dimension and so all we are doing is to subtract the mean, okay, the mean from a particular, across a particular dimension from the data itself. And we return that, okay. Now, by doing this, because we are finding the mean of the data, um, one thing I noticed was that, um, the, well, that shouldn't have been an issue, the nuns and the rest, but there were some other things that um, made some points or some great points produce infinite values. And so we'd have to deal with that. So we use this function to perform a check. So wherever our data, in this case, we're using a dummy argument. So wherever our data is infinity, that's positive or negative, it should be treated as a none. Okay, so we pick wherever it is. It is not infinity instead. And so the infinite ones will go to nuns. And wherever it's not negative infinity, so the infinite negative values would also go to none, and that's it. And the concept of grid was just to um, be able to use this both on graded data by using the word method for graded data and then also the normal um, array subsetting approach for regular, you know, ASCII form data. Okay, so, and that's it, and we return our P. And so that's for the normally and then the infinity check. And then we come to the visualization. So. With this component, okay, so our DOI, which was the day of year groupings, will tell us the groupings we have. And then so it tells us, okay, for label one, which is day one, these are the characterizations, okay, because it's a, comp a whole time series. And now we create a copy of this. And we are left with, I mean, exactly the whole data. And I decided to run this or change this into a list so that I can maintain only the IDs or the labels alone. Okay. And this gives us the labels of one, two, three, six, six. Ignoring the value components of the dictionary. Okay. So once we have that out of the way, it means we can pass this to our X, which will be making use for our X as this. And then we use a plt.subplot to create a figure environment, give it a figure size and assign that to fig and then the axis. And so from there now, we found the mean of uh, grouped data. So what we are doing is to find the mean across every grouping. Okay, so doi.mean will give us Remember that our DOI was just the grouped data, so it was placed in clusters. 
And so we are trying to find the mean of all the D1s, the mean of all D2s and all that. So we find the mean and then that's it, as simple as that. And we have just 366 data points, okay, representing the climatologies for every respective D. Okay, and we then run the infinity check on the climatological means that we found. So that if there's any infinite value, it is chained to none. And that's what we have here. And we rename that as AVG data, that's like the average data. And so we can just plot the average data, which would be, in this case, the red line will be a representation of our red line, which is the um, area average precipitation, okay? And so that's clearly what we have there, which we've plotted in the color R and labeled RR for rainfall. And then we made use of the stand, which is the anomaly over the average data. So we found the anomaly of the average data. And then bear in mind that because the data has been um, grouped by day of year, and then at the point of finding the mean of it, we found the mean over the time. So that's by default because this is just one dimensional in this case, the three dimensions have been all um, broken down because we found the mean over the latitude and longitude. For, that's for the aerial average. And now we are finding the mean over the time, which has been grouped. So our time dimension changes from time to day of year. All right. And so now to find the average, we can't find average over that we can't find anomaly over the time again because the dimension has changed from time to day of year. And so now we would find the anomaly over the dimension day of year instead. And we plot this over our axis. Okay, so we assign axis back to the AX. And then we maintain the color of blue and labeled it as anomaly. And so that would be the blue shade in there. And then when we're done, we now created the legend in the upper left hand. And we also had the Y label that's for the Y axis label and then the X axis label being day of year. And because of the zero mark, which is the black line beneath that's separating the actual data from the, I mean, the negative anomalies and the rest, we had to create that. And to do that, there's a horizontal line. So we pick our axis and we add dot AX H line representing the horizontal line. In the case of verticals, you use V line. And with the horizontal line means Y has been equated to a value. So we are picking Y to be equal to zero. And we color that as black, okay. And so we are going to run this alone so we can see what the output is. So while that is at it, that's for the entire left hand. Now we would want to create the cumulative. And so in order not to place that on one end, we wanted that to be on the other end. So we have to twin the axis, but we are maintaining the X axis. And so we are twinning over the X. That means we have separate Y's, but with the same X. So yes, so this is what we've produced. So we go back up here and then we indicate that from the AX, that's the original axis we had, we should twin the X and then rename this as AX1. That's a new axis, say one, okay? And then we found the anomaly of the average data again over the dimension day of year, which is clearly the same as the anomalies we had. And then we are finding the cumulative sum. That means it's going to be cumulatively being added. It's going to be added together from the start all the way to the end. And once we are done with that, which we are calling the anom, we then will plot the anom against our X and with a green color. And then we label that as a cumulative daily mean rainfall anomaly. And that should produce the cumulative anomalies for us. Okay, now I'll try to um, explain this simply. Now the concept for identifying the onset sensation. So I could have used just the norm and then use the where method, but um, trying that, we noticed that uh, it created a bit of delay as to why that is the case. I mean, we are still probing into it. And once we identify, we'll definitely be able to communicate. If somebody also has an idea you could also share with us via the comment section. So what we did was to just pick the values and we named that as just anomaly variable. 
and that was easier because now we're going to treat it as ASCII data. And we created a window. In this case, our focus was on a 28, representing at least nearly a month. I mean, in most cases, like a month and even sometimes close to a month. And that's because with this 28, we can create a range and see if there's any, you know, curve feature representing a dip. So in this case, we want to see if this curve feature would show or what we see up here. So the peaks or the dips representing the onset. So the dips would be the onset, the peaks would be the cessations. And like I said, there could be multiple of these based on the rainfall pattern. Okay. So we used 28 and then we created an onset um, blank array and the same as the cessation. And then we loop through um, a range of the DX representing the 28 all the way to the length of the anomaly, in this case, 366 minus 28, because we wanted to go all the way to about um, the day before, you know, this number of days before the end of the year. All right. And all we are saying is that now we are going to do a comparison here. We create a range from this anomaly where the range is starting from whichever point I'm on, which is the I. It could be 28 in increasing steps. So I pick the I minus 28. So I go 28 steps behind and then all the way to 28 steps ahead of my central point. All right. And then I find the minimum value in there. And if that minimum value is equal to the anomaly at the current point or the central point I'm at, then it means that is the onset because that dip we are seeing within the range of values is mapping or matching the anomaly we have for this point. And so then we append that position plus one, okay? Because like the next step will be the onset. So you append that position plus one as well as the value for that location to our onset variable. And then we do same for the cessation, this time using the maximum instead, representing the maximum or the peaks. And we use the same approach. And so when we are done now, the onset would be appended together, it will be appended, the cessations will be appended in the cessation files. Now what we do is to create a copy of the onset and transpose and then pick the column zero, representing in this case, the locations or that's the day of year all right and then we do same for the column one representing the value it's of all the magnitude of rain i mean the cumulative yeah the magnitude of the cumulative and so we do that and we are generating a scatter plot by a scatter plot based on the the location and then also the magnitude and we have a size of the scatter marker that's a marker for the scatter plot of about 300. And we color the onset in black. And we want that to be placed over the various plots. So we give a Z order of a positive so that it's placed above and then created the label for the onset. And we did same for the cessation. And then when we're done now, we created a legend to pick the labels created from the AX1 and use the best location, which is zero. And then once it to be two columns. So we pass in an end call of two. And then we use a B box to anchor to position this where we wanted it to be. So 0 0.75 um, on the X axis on or let's say on the X range and then 1.1 on the Y. So this should be slightly above our plots. And with that, that's how we produce our that's how we reproduce the Dunning um work of onset and cessation detection. And okay, so we just allow it for some time to load. And once we are done with that, we close our NetCDF data using the close method. And this is what we have. Okay. And so once you are here, you can then save your plots by using the plt.save pig. And that's it. So that's all for today. If you have any question, do or to ask from the comment section and we'll be able to respond to you. Or you can send us and they'll reach out to us. And don't forget to share, like, comment, and then we hope to expand on the network and get lots of people more involved and um, learning and going together as a network or as a team. So um, do all to reach us and we are always glad to help you out. Have a wonderful time and see you in the next session of a Python tutorial series. Bye-bye.